cash the check, you elected a remedy in the state of New York. You're not allowed to sue your employer. And the evidence in my book suggests that that was not accidental or even uh, quasi-accidental. It was deliberate. So these are the hostage families, and they're part of the story, too. And um, these are the funerals, by the way, just quickly. This is the funeral of L.D. Barkley. L.D. Barkley, this is the last thing I'll leave you with. He was the guy with the granny glasses, the tall 21-year-old. Um, they say he was murdered after the guards had taken control of Attica. And um, the evidence seems to very strongly suggest that he was assassinated. Um, but this picture, you see the Black Power salute, you see the unity. I wish you had the bigger picture because you could see that the entire street of Rochester and, it, and there's other funerals going on in Brooklyn, you can't even move. There are so many people out in the street. Um, and this one on the right is the, host the funerals of the hostages. And um, uh, there was one more slide, but I guess not. That was it. So. I look forward to talking about this. This is, um, again, I think this is probably one of the most important uh, freedom struggles of the 20th century, and um, uh, I would love to talk about it more, so thank you. Again, we're going to have a moderated Q&A between uh, Dr. Toussaint Osier and uh, Heather Thompson. Thank you. Take a breath. <laughs> Take a moment. Um, uh, one more time for me, Ron. Um, so now that the breath is, is over, I want to kind of <laughs> jump right into it. I mean, you, you. Uh, we ended just now, and thank you first and foremost for those um, uh, that slideshow, because I think one of the things that you touched on really well is that many of us think we know about Attica, but there's a lot that we don't know. And um, in many ways, um, this book is a testament to really kind of unpacking the layers of information that exist out there. Um, you ended by saying that you know this is one of the most important freedom struggles of the 20th century. Could you say a little bit more about why you think that's the case, and also what um, initially kind of uh, brought you to focusing on this particular this particular struggle and making this uh, 10, 12, 13 year project? Well, well, those questions, the answers to those questions are related. Um, I was, uh, by training, um, a civil rights historian, an urban historian, a historian of African American history, in no small part because of growing up in Detroit. And my first book was trying to understand Detroit and trying to, understand, trying to understand the black freedom struggle in Detroit. And, and really trying to get my head around how could it be that uh, people who are standing together for, again, you know, basic, basic human rights end up becoming the enemies and end up becoming the rationale for building one of the most repressive police states in, uh, you know, on the globe. How can that, how can those things gel? What happens? Who's dominating this narrative? Um, so first, I turn my attention to Detroit, but Attica always loomed out there, sort of in my mind, because I saw, some of you probably have seen Eyes on the Prize, and there's this amazing half hour segment on Eyes on the Prize uh, about Attica. Um, there was some footage, and Big Black is speaking, and a lot of the other brothers are speaking, and I thought, why don't we know? This is crazy. Like, these are probably the most marginalized citizens of all. Those who are behind bars with ostensibly the least power, and yet somehow they bring the state of New York to its knees. What is that? So that was uh, that was the project that I wanted to understand. By the way, not understanding when I began it that it was going to take me 13 years because the state of New York has shut down all the records related to Attica. Um, you can't just go to an archive and write about Attica. Um, and it's a journey to figure out who's got the story. Well, who has the story are the survivors. And that's in part because this moment, which is the greatest freedom struggle moment, um, everybody is looking at the cities where they're coming from, which are being policed with an inch of their life, where police brutality is literally going to bring Detroit to one of the most 
dramatic urban rebellions of all the urban rebellions. Um, people are trying to make sense of it. They're trying to articulate a critique of it. And Attica is kind of like this epicenter of this connection between what's happening in the streets, what's happening behind bars, and really, because it is behind bars, the absolute, what do you want to say, the, the climax of this clash between the state and the people. Um, yeah, it's happening at Kent State, it's happening in Detroit, it's happening at Wounded Knee, but there's something about Attica where it's so contained, uh, I just felt like we needed to understand that. And why is, is it, well, is that part of the reason why this was, uh, this is, you know, as academics, the trend is usually to go with the university press, you do an academic book. Is that part of the reason why this is sort of more of a, a narrative story and more of a trade press? Absolutely. I mean, I, um, I struggled a lot with what to do with this book because by, as, as a historian by training, my first book was with Cornell University Press, which is an upstate press. And needless to say, they would have wanted a, a history sure. of Attica. Yeah. Um, but I, the longer I got into this, the more I understood that this was a story that I wanted everybody to read. I didn't care whether they were in a small town in Omaha, you know, outside of Omaha, Nebraska, or whether they were in Bed-Stuy. I wanted it to be accessible. So we opted for a narrative. Um, you know, of course, when you do that, you're, you're one minute you're in D-Yard, one minute you're in the governor's office, one minute you're in uh, the White House, and it's written to be read. But, um, but as a historian, that was a challenge, because we, what we want to also do is we want to ground what we write in uh, the literature, in the theory, in, in all that we do. So, um, you know, I, I think this book might, um, it accomplishes, I think, the popular narrative, mm -hmm. but it also, I hope, invites a lot of discussions about the kind of behind the scenes uh, arguments that are being made here. Um, one of the things um, a number of our questioners uh, found interesting about the book is the, book, the title of the book is uh, Blood in the Water, uh, the Attica Uprising of 1971 and uh, its legacy. And when you read the book, um, a bit more than half of it actually comes after right, the rebellion itself. Um, and really this question of how, how might it be possible to kind of squeeze some modicum of justice out of what took place in Attica and hold the state accountable for what took place. Um, was there a particular, I don't know, um, negotiation or calculus that you had to make um, in, in deciding that you were going to focus so much of the book on this question of state accountability and was there something lost? Was there a way in which some of the uh, experiences of the prisoners or uh, others who were connected to the um, to the rebellion uh, became uh, a, a smaller part of the story in terms of in, in focusing so much of attention on terms of the state action. Mm -hmm. itself. So yes and yes. <laughs> um, you're you're right. The, the the book is probably I mean probably the first third of the book is actually about the uprising, and the rest of the book is about the 40 year struggle to be heard after the sure. uprising. Um, and there's a I I think that the reason for that is there's several reasons for that. One of the most important to me was that um, the actual rebellion I felt was covered quite well by a number of memoirs uh, of brothers in the yard, but also other people who'd been in the yard. And I also felt that the rebellion itself, I mean, make no mistake about it, there's still a lot of stuff that we didn't know that's also now in there. But I felt like that was the one piece of it we understood better. Mm -hmm. We understood that people were moved by George Jackson's struggle. We understood that people were reading, you know, voraciously reading uh, behind bars and trying to articulate a critique of imprisonment and punishment in America. But what we didn't know was how in the world could we have had this enormous rebellion and then build the most repressive penal state on the planet? And to me, that was the really interesting question. What happens after Attica that leads us not down the path of greater justice, but indeed the opposite? How can, how can, uh, how can the state police commit this kind of atrocity and we've got voters around America asking for more police? 
there's some huge disconnect here that I wanted to understand. And then, frankly, that's where the Attica brothers really come into the story. Sure. Because they had been trying to tell this story, the 40 year after story, and nobody was listening to them. So I wanted to devote the majority of the book to that part of their story. You know that when they finally came to court, which was in 2000, to have a settlement, um, to that day, the state was saying that nothing had happened. It had been a fraternity hazing at best. Nothing had happened. And one of the Attica brothers comes to take the stand to tell his story. And he takes a very long time to get up to the dais where he's going to speak. And the judge says to him, you know, take your time. You know, I want, this is, by the way, this is the settling judge who's one of the other few heroes in this book who actually lets them tell the story. He says, take your time. And when he gets up there, the, the, the man says, I'm sorry, Judge Seleska, it took me a while. I, I don't walk so well. And he says, tell me your story. He was really tall. He was like six foot six or seven. And um, he can't walk because he was an NBA prospect. He was about ready to get out of prison. And the guards knew that. The troopers knew that. So they took rifle butts and they broke every bone in his feet. And he could never really walk again because, of course, he never had medical treatment. And I wanted to tell both the story of that repression but also his story of getting on that bus 40 years later and, and still being determined to make the state accountable. In, um, in like placing the Act for Rebellion in the particular moment in time in which it occurred, um, could you tell us a little bit more about how um, uh, folks like George Jackson and kind of the Black Power era, and how those influences shaped the experiences of the Attica brothers um, in the kind of period leading up to the rebellion and then also afterwards as well in terms of how they carried forward the struggle over the next 40 years or so? So um, it was critically important. George Jackson, as um, you keep hearing him shout it out, and that's because um, George Jackson is one of these really important figures of the 20th century because he epitomizes all that's wrong with our uh, with our um, system. He goes to jail for having stole $72 of a gas station and basically never can get out because of the way our sentencing works. He was tortured, he was beaten, and ultimately he articulates his critique of our system in a series of writings. Um, one of the most important uh, was uh, Blood in My Eye, and I have to say that the title of my book, you'll notice, uh, which is Blood in the Water, is sort of a it has kind of double meaning. On the one hand, I title it this because, of, because one of the brothers, when the shooting is going on, it's a quote from him, he looks up, and it's raining, and all he can see, and then these are his words, all he can see is blood in the water. But of course, he would have also known about George Jackson because they are reading everybody. And Jackson gets murdered. And this happens right before this prison uprising. And everybody in Attica goes to breakfast that morning in utter silence. And even the guys, the younger guys, some of the older guys, they don't quite know what's going on. And they very quickly are educated on the importance of standing together and speaking up. So it is a fundamental uh, foundation for why we get the rebellion, why we get the unity, why we get the struggle. Uh, and I will also say, though, that what does more recruiting for the black power movement at Attica than you could even imagine is the actions of the state. You know, Big Black, by his own admission, he was not political. In fact, he just kind of wanted to stick to himself. He's like, you know, blah, blah, you know, do your reading. Um, he becomes one of the most political and powerful and militant of the brothers because of what he sees in the yard because he because he you know there's no theorizing about it right I mean, he just he just he, he felt it so that organization not only is a foundation but then remember I showed you those pictures of the support for the Attica brothers afterwards think about it this way the state of New York amasses one of the biggest prosecutions in American history it literally is I think it is I think the biggest prosecution um, and they only they don't manage in indicting any they don't imagine convicting uh, all they convicted two and they eventually had that thrown out. 
because the political education going on on the outside to mobilize, to defend, uh, and again, I just want to say there's three chapters or four on just this defense effort. Yeah. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. And that's where that political legacy is. You see it again in the book. It's where it comes back. Um, one other thing, and I'll stop on this. And critical to that political thread of the black freedom struggle and really about the black power movement is that the brothers insist on being defended pro se. They, they insist on defending themselves. They want legal help. They want someone to stand with them. They want a lawyer to be there too. But they insist on speaking. They insist on their own defense. And if you read these trial transcripts, this is a moment when people go into this courtroom and they tell it. I mean, they don't accept, they don't accept that the system is gonna pass judgment on them, so they stand up and educate the judge. And this is all coming out of that tradition. Um, for myself and for a number of other, uh, especially young scholars who read this book, one of the things that, uh, and I can imagine for many other, uh, many other people who have read it, um, the chapter, uh, really it's just a, a couple chapters that you have on the retaking of the prison and the, sort of the violence of it, and really the sort of naked brutality of it, uh, were, you know, were particularly shocking. And I'm curious, um, uh, you don't have to go into like, you know, exact detail, but was there a part of that story that, um, that hadn't been told before that you kind of discovered in the course of your research? And um, how is it that you, um, I guess, uh, figured out how you were going to go about kind of detailing the experience of prisoners like, um, like Frank Big uh, Blacksmith and others who really had to contend with this sort of torture that not only followed the kind of immediate retaking of the facility, but the, um, the way in which prisoners were really brutalized in part as a way of kind of reestablishing their um, you know, their, their subservient position within the facility and also as a way to exact revenge and also as a way to uh, get prisoners to testify against one another in the course of the state's investigation. Mm -hmm. um, the chapter he's referring to is called No Mercy. And um, I have to say that that was the hardest chapter to write. I don't, I don't, I don't really know. Um, it was the hardest chapter to write for a number of reasons. One of them is that, uh, first of all, I, I, in some respects, you could say the chapter wrote itself because it was the brothers telling their stories. Yeah. So what I know there, I know from them. And I had actually several of them say to me, you know, don't hold back. Just tell it. Like, it's, it's ugly, but don't, don't hold back. Tell it. But on the other hand, as a historian, I felt completely inadequate telling it. Because how many adjectives are there for what I was trying to describe? How do you really describe that level of brutality without coming back to your same old tired vocabulary of horrific, and terrible? So I tried whenever possible to let them tell it in that chapter. And frankly, um, so in that sense, we did know it before. But the we is, the brothers knew it. And of course, the perpetrators knew it, but the public didn't know it because every time they tried to tell it, they were silenced, they were shut down. So that's one of the reasons why they kept saying, don't hold back, just tell it. But some of the stuff actually they didn't know. And that's because you can't be in all places at the same time. And so by bringing together what the state, what, what that guy, Jim O'Day, the, the National Guardsman was reporting, and what um, some of the doctors that were finally in there they were, I mean, they were traumatized by this. And so they testified later, and they told their stories. So in this chapter, I'm able to bring together the stories of everybody who witnessed this horror show. And the two things I think you would agree is not only is it brutal, but it's racially brutal. Um, not only, I mean, there, there's this one episode where essentially the trooper is not only shooting and but he's forcing this guy down on his knees and forcing him to give the white power salute. I mean, this is, this is the level of depravity uh, that this chapter covers. But it felt, um, it's also a chapter that, you know, it ends sort of abruptly because people, you just gotta stop. You, you know, you just can't, 
No, but I definitely think for, for myself and for many other readers, it's you're left not only with the, the impressions, whether it's kind of uh, trying to sort of visualize what's taking place or just uh, thinking about the, uh, the, the men who are in this particular situation, but also the circumstances that they had to contend with, you know, uh, once they're put back in, the, in their cells. And it's, you know, a situation where people have been shot multiple times and if they're still alive, yeah. right? Having to deal with, you know, if, if you're unfortunate enough to be in that sort of situation, you imagine, okay, I'm in a hospital, I've got some sort of anesthesia, you know, I'm being looked after by a medical staff, but here's somebody who's tossed back into a cell and you, you have the same doctors who had previously been working in Attica who are now like, oh, that's not really serious. Exactly. I'm not going to treat you. Um, and that process of almost sort of re-educating prisoners, that here you are again, you're not a human being, yeah. right? You yeah. are uh, at a level beneath those of us who are civilians or citizens or whatever the idea is. And indeed, even when, I mean, to, to, absolutely, and to, to really underscore that, even the physicians that finally make their way in there who are not these, these really barbaric Two mm -hmm. doctors who are the Attica doctors, but the but the but the legitimate medical professionals that come in, um, they're they're often trying to treat somebody, and a trooper will come up and kick that guy in the head, or dump him on his dump him on the cement, or urinate in an open wound, or play Russian roulette with him as he's screaming, with a shotgun. or 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 and they're ta this is the other thing, and I, this is the last I'll regale us with this, but. You got to remember that, and when you're in prison, you know, getting medical care is so extraordinarily difficult anyway. So when you have dentures or you have eyeglasses, they are your most prized possession because if you don't have teeth, you can't eat, and if you don't have glasses, you can't see. And one of the things that happens after Attica, in addition to the brutality that I just described, the troopers are removing people's dentures, throwing them up in the air, and taking baseball bats and smashing them. They are smashing everybody's glasses so they can't see. And so, again, it's, it's trying to convey the level of barbarism that goes on. It, it is difficult to really convey it. And not have that be almost pornographically dominant in the narrative because meanwhile, and I, and I keep saying this, meanwhile on the outside, uh, people are banging on those prison doors and demanding to be let in and, and trying to file injunctions against this abuse and trying to let these brothers out and get them into hospitals. And so it's a, re it's a, it's a really interesting uh, push and pull. Um, a good part of the, the second couple of thirds of the book, uh, two thirds of the book, really focus on this question of a cover up by uh, the Rockefeller administration. And uh, one, so it kind of seems almost sort of in line with the phrase that comes from the early 1970s, it's not the crime, it's the cover up that really gets people in trouble. And um, I was curious as to um, what if you could say a little bit about in terms of how you found out about the, the way in which um, the circumstances at Attica were covered up. And um, two, uh, one, of the, one of the things that, um, has kind of stood out to me as an, really an odd aspect from my own activist experience is um, these kind of moments where you have somebody who's on the side of the sort of, um, the people that you're fighting who provides you with some information. It's kind of, I don't know, if a whistleblower or kind of at least um, tries to assist in one way or another, depending on how helpful that in, ends up becoming at the end of the day. And the ways in which um, some of the work of Malcolm Bell or whoever, uh, whomever, um, was, was really helpful in terms of kind of unpacking some of the way in which the cover up operated. Yeah, so of course, anyone who lived through Attica knew from jump that there was a cover up and knew from jump that something must have gone wrong because no number of law enforcement ever stood trial. Sure. So for anyone who knew anything about Attica, that was not the news flash. But what the problem was we didn't know how it worked. We didn't know who were, who were the who the who the who were. <laughs> who were the people orchestrating it? How did they pull it off? How did they manage it? And that's because um, as much as the brothers had been very successful in telling the story of brutality, because they're trying to tell this to the magistrates, we're trying to tell it to the Supreme Court. Um, 
we had no documents on the Attica investigation, what was going on on the Rockefeller side of it. And I, uh, again, I want to, you know, this is why the book takes so long. I file freedom of information requests. Uh, we're historians, we're used to doing that. Um, if somebody wasn't paying attention, sometimes some interesting stuff came my way. But the minute someone was paying attention, you know, we got Danielle McGuire in the audience working on the Aljo Motel murder here in Detroit. And she, uh, and she, and she can tell you, she and I have spent a lot of hours talking about the, the, the frustration of freedom of information. But the fact of the matter was, I wasn't going to get this from the state. And so I had a very lucky break. I had two lucky breaks. I talk about them in the, 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 the book. Um, one of them was happening upon a courthouse in upstate New York where a bunch of Attica documents had been moved. Nobody knew what they were, what they had. Um, it was the mother load of documents. And I was able to finally see uh, the who did what, what the state knew, when it knew it who, which members of law enforcement had in fact committed crimes, or at least the state thought of committed crimes, and were let off the hook. That's where I also learned about the Rockefeller Pool House meetings. And um, nobody has seen those documents. To this day, um, a reporter tried to go back to find those documents. They're all gone. Um, I have, I managed to scan quite a few of them, take notes from a lot of them, but they now don't exist. The other lucky break was that the state police had collected, by the way, remember I told you they got to do the investigation? Not only that, they came in, they swept everything out of the yard, they took what they felt would indict the prisoners, they buried everything else behind Attica, and all of the things they collected, they put in this 30-foot Quonset hut in Batavia, New York. And for some reason, on the 40th anniversary of Attica, some, again, clueless, a uh, person at the New York State Police calls up the New York State Museum and says, we've got a bunch of Attica stuff, do you want it? And um, the guy who was running the State Museum had just read my op-ed on the rebellion, the Attica uprising, which was in the New York Times. And he called me and he says, you know, we've got all the stuff the State Police just turned over from Attica. Can you come to Albany and help us know what we've got here? And I said, what? <laughs> I'll be on the next plane. Um, and that was pivotal, not because it told me something I didn't know, but it was one of the most heart-wrenching moments of my research because I open boxes and I pull out clothes and I was holding L.D. Barclays, blood-stained, stiff clothes, um, the clothes of the hostages. From 40 years ago. From 40 years ago that had never been returned to anybody, um, and opened up boxes of all of, remember that chaos you saw on that first slide? Well, some of that was from the cell sweeps afterwards. And they ripped out these guys' books, and they ripped out their legal proceedings, which remember, you don't have a typewriter. Everyone hand writes everything. So if you want to, if you, if any legal thing you hand write, ripped them up. They're pictures of little pe people's little girls, people's kids, shredded, torn up, just, it was one of the most, for some reason, emotionally wrenching parts of doing the research. And one of the most important things that I found in that collection, which by the way, is all gone. You also can't see that. The guy who uh, showed me that, he lost his job. I just sent him a book and he <laughs> wrote to me and he said, thank you. And he says, I wish I could have, I wish I could have given people back, more people back their things. Um, but one of the things I found was a notebook. It was a spiral bound, you know, mead, like what we're sending our kids off to school, and those kind of notebooks. And little squares, uh, people are writing, the brothers inside. This is right after the rebellion, when they're, when they're somehow trying to get word to their loved ones that they're still alive. Because by the way, on the outside, nobody knows what's happened. Nobody knows whether their son is dead or alive, or they don't know anything. And so in these little margins would be written, you know, the address of their mother, you know, Mrs. whatever, Frida Smith, and the address in Brooklyn, and then a little note that says, you know, tell sissy I'm fine. Or, um, you know, um, you know, tell my mother I'm, I'm hurt, but I'm okay. I mean, it was just the most, it was the most wrenching thing I saw because I knew that the reason why I had it was because it had been taken out of the cells and it never made it out of Attica. And so all of those notes to those family members never made it where they were supposed to go. Um, just real quick about the cover-up. 
Did you, uh, could you tell us a little bit of, uh, more about, um,